And our gospel reading for this morning from Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. People of God, thanks, thanks be, be to God. God. I'm just going to pray for the preacher this morning. I'm going to wait. Somebody will do it. This is how we develop the habit of praying in public. You don't have to be eloquent. You don't have to be articulate. You just have to pray. Kaylee, you can do it again. Come on up here, girl. Ten years old. She's shaming everybody in the room. Thank you, sweetie. Dear Lord, please bless Pastor Terry whatever struggles she may go through and whatever challenges she may face. Let, let the goodness inside her stay true forever. And I thank you, Lord, for blessing us with an amazing pastor. Amen. 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 Thank you, sweetheart. Touches my heart every time she opens her mouth. It's a little warm. Okay. Some of you know that I used to be a psychiatric chaplain at St. Elizabeth's Hospital and was a federal psychiatric hospital in the District of Columbia. I worked with deaf patients. There were two times I was called in in the middle of the night for an emergency. The first was a woman named Narvi, who was a sweet thing. She needed to see me, and she said, get my, and they called me good, sweet priest. I worked with Randy Pumphrey, who was good, beautiful priest, and if you saw Randy, you'd know why they called him that. But I was good, sweet priest, and she kept saying, I want my good, sweet priest, my good, sweet priest, my good, sweet priest. She called me, and he says, you've got to come, you've got to come, and I drove in in the middle of the night. She looked at me and said, you, Eve, you, you, Eve, you, you, Eve, you, you, Eve, you. I was like, what are you talking about? She said, you, Eve, you, you live in a cave. Married to Adam, and I was like, I am not married to Adam. I don't live in a cave. I live in a house. No, you Eve, you, you Eve, you, you Eve, you. She was very upset, and we said, What in the world is making you say I'm Eve? And she went and got the newspaper. It was the tabloid paper, the World Daily News. Snarvy had grounds privileges. She could go to highs across the street if she wanted to, and she came back. Sure enough, they had a line drawing. Adam and Eve's bones were found in a cave in Africa. And they did a line drawing of what Eve looked like. And if it was me, dressed like Betty Rubble. <laughs> the other time, and the, after that, I never went on the, the floor without the nurse going, you, Eve, you, you, Eve, you, Eve, you, Eve, you, Eve, you, Eve, you. Thank you. The other time was when there was a 13-year-old on the floor. And she, they called me in the middle of the night and said, you got to come because she's seen the devil. That's a strange thing to hear. So I'm driving to the hospital thinking she's seen the devil. I wonder what devil she's seen. Now they took things like that very seriously in the psychiatric hospital because part of my job is to help them determine if someone is having an authentic religious experience or religious psychosis. So I went and I said to her, what's the devil look like? Ugly, ugly, ugly. I said, well, that's true. And she said, he has a red suit and pointy horns and a tail with a point and a pitchfork and all these things, and I realized that this was the week before Halloween. And I looked, and there was a Kmart ad. 
and right on the front was the devil's costume. That's the devil she saw. Now, if I saw somebody with pointy horns and a tail and a pitchfork, I would run. If I saw a snake talking to me, I would really run. But temptation doesn't always look like that, does it? Doesn't seem to be that scary to us, does it? Even in the garden, and we're going to take these sort of in chronological order, not the order John read, but we're going to take them in chronological order. In the Garden of Eden, you have the story, you all know this story, right? Is there anyone here who had not heard this story before? Then you get the biblical test du jour here. What happens after this? When the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked, they sewed fig leaves together, made loincloths for themselves. What did they do then? God came walking in the garden, and what did the man and woman do? They what? They hid. Why'd they hide? Because they were naked. God said, where are you? We can't come out. Why not? We're naked. God said, who told you you were naked? Did you eat from that tree? And what does that, and this is, this is the origin of buck passing. It was that woman, the one you gave me. You, you gave her to me. If you hadn't given her to me, Lord, she never would have tempted me. And I, now look at this place. Look, look up here. Because I, if I had a dollar for every time someone said to me, you know, women are the cause of the fall. You all did this to us. You brought this upon humankind. You destroyed, you destroyed everything in the garden. If I had a dollar for every time I heard that, I'd have a lot of dollars. What does it say here? She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. He didn't say, no, get behind me, woman. No, 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 no. He just said, okay, looks good, I'll eat it, right? Right? A lot of fight putting up there, right? We're going to skip. That's the first book in the Old Testament. Let's go to the first book in the New Testament, Matthew. The fourth chapter of Matthew. This is not the end of Jesus' teaching. This is not the time when he's approaching his passion and his death. This is the beginning of his earthly ministry. He has been baptized, and he goes into the wilderness because what leads him to the wilderness? He's led by what? God's Holy Spirit leads him to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Not just out there to have a good time, not on a camping trip. He was led there to be tempted by the devil. God's going to put him out there. God's pretty sure what he's going to do. The tempter comes and says to him, if you're the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Forty days and forty nights. We're talking about fasting, maybe giving up a meal every day or giving up sweets or something for Lent. Anybody here ever fasted forty days and forty nights? Think you could do that? I don't think I could do that. I don't know. I'd be by day twenty, I'd be hurt pretty bad. I do believe. But what happens here? Jesus, it says, was famished. Sort of the big duh there, right? Forty days, forty nights, no food. Would you be hungry? If you had the ability to take stones and turn them into hot loaves of bread, I would be making bread like crazy. Stone, stone, bread, 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 rye, pumpernickel, white. You know, we'd, we'd have a variety of breads out there. But that's not really the temptation. Is it? It's not to eat. It's to prove who he is. If you are the Son of God, if you're who you say you are, if you're who you think you are, if you who you claim to be, do this thing, because you've got the power. But Jesus is not called to use that power as a human, is he? He's called to live a life like we can live. And he answers with scripture, saying, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil takes him, puts him on the top of the temple and says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, if you're who you say you are. And guess what? The devil quotes scripture better than most United Methodists do. He knows the scripture, and what does he say? He says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus replies, again it's written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil takes him to a very high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor, and says to him, I will give you this. Because the devil does have a certain amount of control, doesn't he, on these things. All I have to do is worship me. Let's go then to the third, the Corinthians. This is chronologically the one that's written for us. These others are written to tell us what the first man and woman did and what Jesus did. Look at what we're called to do. So if you think you're standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that was not common to everyone. God is faithful. He will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. 
This is the most misquoted line in the entire Bible. Because how many times when someone's going through a really hard time have they heard the words, God will not give you more than you can handle. God's not going to put more on you than you can handle. Have you ever, someone ever said that to you? Have you ever said that to somebody else? You have? It's not true. Sorry. Don't say that again, because what are some of the things that people have to handle in the world that are hard? Cancer? What else? You can talk back. This is one of those times you can talk back. Depression. Losing a family member. Amen to that. So I hear depression and anxiety. What else do I hear out there? Poverty. COVID. War. All those things. Does God put those on us? Absolutely not. Those do not come from God. They do not come from God. They do not come from God. AIDS does not come from God. People in Haiti were not punished for something their ancestors did when that earthquake destroyed their nation. The people in Syria and Turkey have not been punished by God because of their faithlessness. That's not why an earthquake happened. So God does not give us those things. And to say to someone who is hurting, God's not going to give you more than you can handle. It's really a sad thing. Because God doesn't give that to us. And all it says is you brought it on yourself, doesn't it? What this really means, it's worse than that people. This one gets me every time. No temptation has overtaken you that it's not common to everyone. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your strength. With the temptation, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. How do you remember Flip Wilson? Anybody remember Flip Wilson, the Flip Wilson show? Back in the early 70s. I was a kid when it was on. It was a great show. One of the funniest people I've ever met or seen. I didn't meet him. But what happened then? He had a character named Geraldine. Geraldine always talked about her boyfriend, Killer. He dressed really wild, had a lot of makeup on. And if she got caught with someone, what was her excuse? The devil made me do it. Sorry, but God doesn't make us do it. The devil doesn't make us do it. The devil lost his power when Jesus was raised from the dead. So whose problem is it if we're tempted and we give in to temptation? I hate to break it to you, boys and girls. It's ours. We're the ones who failed to stand up because God will give us the means to endure it. So we can't say the devil made us do it. We can't say God made us do it. We can only say that we make us do it. It's not being tempted over things like chocolate or cookies during Lent, is it? What are the things that tempt people that really get us in trouble? Kids up here have some good ones. Sometimes you're tempted to cheat on a test. Sometimes you're tempted to cheat on your taxes. <gasps> really? No. But worse than that, we're tempted to hold on to grudges. We're tempted to hold on to heartache. and We're tempted to judge other people. We're tempted to criticize other people. We are tempted to do those kinds of things that put other people down. I told you about the Dress Down Wednesday. When I dressed down on Wednesday, I was treated very poorly. Reminded me of the time my husband and I went to a furniture store on a holiday for a sale. We had been painting our house. We looked like a couple of bums. We went into this furniture store. It was sales on commission. We wanted this little $29 dresser to put inside a closet. No one would wait on us because I heard a man say, I'm not going to wait on them, you wait on them. Somebody else said, I don't want to wait on them, you wait on them. Finally, somebody was like, do you need help? Yes, we need this dresser. And they looked like, of course they do. They need a $29 dresser because they're poor people. And he filled out the form and said, just give it to the woman at the cash register. We stood in line a long time. And I, if I had one of the $29 dresser, I would have left that store. But when it was over, I went to a guy and said, you know what? I really need living room furniture as well, but I don't have to buy it from you. And he said, well, we have all these, we have beautiful living room furniture if you'd like to see some. And I said, not from you, buddy. I said, I will go where they help people, no matter what they're dressed like. He said, oh, I wasn't judging you. I thought, no, you were judging me. So that pretty woman thinks that I didn't get all dressed up like Julia Robertson going and say, big mistake. But I was treated very poorly that day. 
And the day I did the dress down day on my fast exercise, same thing happened. Everywhere I went, people just sort of ignored me and waited on other people who were dressed better than I was. I did a worship service that night in a pair of pants that had paint stains on them, a sweater that had an elbow out and a pocket missing, and a stained up blouse. And somebody said, gee, Pastor Terry, don't we pay you enough? Someone else said, gee, Pastor Terry, you haven't done laundry in a while, huh? I said, no, I explained to her what I was doing, and the woman got tears in her eyes and said, wow. Wow. She said, I really do look at people and judge them by what they wear, don't I? That's the temptation, isn't it, to be judgmental, to be critical, to be hard on others. It's a temptation to hold on to grudges, and that's one thing that I'm afraid is going to kill Epworth Church if we don't get a handle on it one of these days, because there are grudges that have been held for years here. Ooh, stepping on toes this morning. Toes I step on may be my own, so don't worry about that. We're tempted to hold on to hurts and pains and not like this person or that person or the other person because something that happened years and years and years ago. That's a temptation. It does not come from God. You can't blame the devil. But this is what Paul says. So if you think you're standing, watch out to see you not fall. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from the worship of idols. Now, nobody has a statue at home that you're bowing down to, right? And saying, oh, that's my God. We bow down to all sorts of idols, don't we? The idols of, I'm right, you're wrong. The idol of, I'm better than you are. The idol of, I'll never get over what you did to me. So I'm going to give you one thing to do during Lent. If you take on none of these activities, none of these fasts, none of these things to make your life simpler, do one thing for me. Instead of saying, I cannot forgive you for what you've done, say, I won't forgive you for what you've done, because that's what, that's what it is, really, isn't it? We can forgive. We just don't want to. Lent's not the easiest time of year, is it? It calls us to dig inside ourselves, to look for things, to make ourselves more available to God's grace. You can't be available to God's grace unless you're willing to accept it in your own heart and show it to somebody else. So what else are we going to do during this time of Lent? We're going to have communion every Sunday. Every Sunday we're going to have communion. Because there's no better way to get closer to God than to remember how much Jesus loves you. There's no better way to remember how much Jesus loves you than to share in his body and his blood. Because he did this on the night before he died. He took bread on the night before he died. He took the cup on the night before he died. And think about himself. He knew that they were going to deny him, desert him, betray him. They knew he knew what we were going to do. And so he said, this is my body, this is my blood. This is when he was on the cross and he looked at them and he said, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So I hope this Lent will be a time for each of us of tending our souls. Because we, we're so busy with so many things, we forget to tend our souls. And simplicity and sacrifice are the themes this week. Because the less hectic our lives are, the more we have time to focus on Christ. And the more we have time to focus on Christ, the more we look at his sacrifice for our sake, and then we sacrifice for him. Not giving up some little sweet or some little indulgence, but giving up the things that break our hearts, that break his heart. Amen. Amen.